Good morning from Austin, Texas. Uh, good afternoon or good evening, whatever you may be. It is a day two of ISOJ 2021, the world's premier global conference on online journalism sponsored by Google News Initiative and Knight Foundation. And thanks to Univision, uh, each session is being simultaneously interpreted into Spanish as well. We have almost 7,000 people um, registered for this conference, so we are very excited. I hope you are excited for the day we have in store, starting with a great keynote session. A few housekeeping reminders before we go there. You can follow the, com the conversation uh, um, by using hashtag ISOJ on Twitter, and you can drop questions and, and comments in chats, both on Zoom and on, U on YouTube. Also on Twitter, uh, using hashtag 20, uh, uh, ISOJ2021. Don't, don't forget to click in the link in the chat to tune into um, our ISOJ2021 Spotify playlist to hear the finest tunes from Austin locals. Remember that we are in Austin, the world's capital of live music. So the, the playlist will kind of bring you here to our music scene. And, and please follow the link to our pick and post page on our website. You can find great graphics there. So you can download them and post on social media to let the world know that you are attending and loving ISOJ. I hope you're loving ISOJ. I love ISOJ. Now let's get uh, into our keynote session with Catherine Viner, Editor-in-Chief in of The Guardian and The Observer. First, let me introduce you to my friend Emilio Garcia Ruiz, who will chair Kat Catherine's keynote session. Until very recently, Emilio co coordinated the successful digital strategy at the Washington Post newsroom. He, he moved to California recently and became the editor-in-chief of the San Francisco Chronicle. This will be a fascinating conversation. Thank you, Rosenthal. Buenvenidos a todos periodistas de otros países. Greetings to everyone around the world. I am delighted and honored to be here today with Catherine Viner, the editor of The Guardian, one of the great recent success stories in publishing. Catherine, welcome. Thanks, Emilio. So we're at this point in our industry uh, with so many publishers struggling that the first thing I think about when I meet an editor from another newsroom is the financial health of their publication. <laughs> In your case, you've been called the architect of the biggest turnaround in British media history, having gone from losing $100 million a year to being profitable. I think everyone here wants to know, how did you do that, Catherine? <laughs> um, uh, well, thank you for that generous uh, introduction, Amelia. I wish, I wish we were all together um, in Austin and I could uh, meet the 7,000 uh, attendees of the um, ISAJ conference. Perhaps there wouldn't be 7,000 if we weren't online. Um, uh, but uh, yes, I mean, I think, um, you know, we tackled the issue on a few fronts uh, when uh, David Pemsel, the former chief executive, and I, we started in 2015. Um, uh, we, we took quite a lot of cost out of the business, but we did that in collaboration with our um, with our colleagues. So, um, uh, for example, we uh, sw switched from uh, publishing in the Berliner format, which was a sort of bespoke print uh, format to um, uh, into the tabloid format, which saved a lot of money. Um, uh, but then I think the thing that really made the difference was, uh, and obviously, and shifted the revenue was our contributions model. And um, I think this is the uh, this is the strand to our strategy that I think has had most attention and probably is most exciting, which was um, this idea um, that uh, you it, 
we do have subscriptions. Uh, subscriptions are a very important part of our reader revenue strategy, subscriptions in digital and in print. But on, in addition, uh, we, said we brought in the contributions uh, strategy, which is where you um, voluntarily uh, give us some money. Um, and it might be uh, because you've read so much of The Guardian that week that you're sort of feeling guilty that you've read so much for free. It might be that you want to pay um, for The Guardian to stay free. You can afford it to pay for it. And you'd like someone who can't afford to pay for it to be able to read it. Um, whatever the motivation. Um, when we started it, 2016, people were very, very uh, suspicious about it, including close colleagues uh, who were sort of, you know, well, what do you get? And I think that's the whole point. You know, if you want to get something, we have the, the subscription strategy. But if you just want to um, support independent journalism in the public interest, if you want to keep Guardian journalism free, and that's an important part um, I think of the Scott Trust remit, which is that the Guardian journalism should be as read as widely as possible. It doesn't mean we would never do a paywall, but I think we found an alternative to a paywall, which is uh, brings in just as much revenue, uh, but also um, uh, means that you can be read very, very widely by a very large number of people. They don't need to uh, be able to afford to pay uh, for the subscription that they can they can read the Guardian uh, for free. Anyway, it was greeted with lots of cynicism. There lots of there was a cartoon in a famous satirical British magazine, Private Eye, which was a sort of begging bowl. Yeah, you know, like a sort of like as if we were um, begging for money. Um, uh, but but the readers understood it. The readers understood what we were getting at, and and it worked. And it's now a very big part of our revenue. And I think. Uh, like a lot of big news organisations, um, you know, our readers really stepped up in 2020 and have really given us a considerable amount of support. Yeah, I don't know who came up with the idea of keeping track of how many people, uh, how many articles the uh, cheapskates read and then putting <laughs> it back in their face. Uh, not that I would know anything about that, uh, but the fact that you go on and then you're told you've read 7,500 stories <laughs> without paying and it's about time you paid. Uh, hasn't worked with me just yet, but we're getting closer, Catherine. We're getting what there. Well, well, I'm gonna find something else that'll work with you, Amelia, because- we're getting very close, I think. We'll and so fine. give us a little of the, of the insight on how many, what percentage of people donate? What, what are the metrics on, on that sort of thing? I mean, that shifts all the time. So we tend not to sort of share numbers on that, but it's, um, and we tend to call it contribute rather than donate as well, because it's not, we're not a charity, you know, we're, we're a business, um, but we're a business that's only in the public interest. I don't know if many people watching know about our um, ownership model, but we're owned by a trust. Uh, there are no shareholders, there's no proprietors. And um, what that means is that, um, Nobody can get rich out of The Guardian and any money that we make and we, we make as a business because we also have a thriving advertising business um, gets plowed, has to get plowed back into the journalism. And that that's part of the remit. Um, so that's a very, very powerful message as well. So, you know, the, the Financial Times did a piece recently questioning whether these $30 a month paywall models that some publishers are using, whether they're actually viable. So many other digital subscriptions. Uh, you know, from Netflix to Spotify to Disney Plus that we all have. D do you think your way is going to be the way others uh, go eventually? Or do you think it's sort of different strokes for different folks? Yeah, I wouldn't necessarily say that what works for The Guardian would work for everyone. I think what you need um, for, for our model to work is a, a readership who is very engaged with you and perhaps a sort of um, distinctive perspective. You know, there aren't many... Uh, global news organisations of our scale that are also progressive and don't have a proprietor and so on. And so I think I think um, you, you need to have something quite distinctive for this model to work. So I wouldn't say uh, necessarily it would work for everyone. I think I think you um, you'd probably um, you know I think I, but I do worry. I, I know the piece you're talking about. I do worry that you know that the biggest uh, news organisations can you know might. Um, take all of the light um, away from the small, smaller news organizations, particularly locally. Yeah, the, we, we first met um, six, seven years ago, right after you had been uh, elected to your position. Uh, and it was a, a very different time for The Guardian. The Guardian was on top of the world. Things were going great. You'd gotten this job. You'd won the election. It was going to be smooth. It was going to be easy. And then, bam, you got hit with all of these financial issues. 
there's a lot of people on the Zoom who are facing the same sort of thing you faced. What, you know, as, as a leader of a newsroom and as a journalist, what, what lessons did you learn that you would impart to other people to get you through what was a clearly a very difficult time? I mean, again, I wouldn't presume to speak to other people for their organisations, but I can say what, what we did, The Guardian. And I think it was it was thinking about what really matters most and who we really are. I do I do have a real faith in looking back to the history. What are our what are our roots and you know what what made us who we are? Is there are there some clues in the past? Because what I've discovered from I'm a real expert now in the histories of the Guardian. It's our 200th birthday next week, so I'm particularly sharp at the moment on these uh, stories. Uh, is that you know you nearly everything people have gone through before. Now it may not be this particular model. I mean, obviously, social media was rather unknown to previous editors, but um, there are similar things. That you know, there was a time when uh, there was a, th a merger with the Times, threatened of the Guardian in the 1960s. How we survived that. Um, there was a time when we um, we took a very strong anti-colonial position against the Boer War in 1902, um, um, at a time when Britain was in incredibly jingoistic fervour. And it was such a controversial move. We lost one seventh of sales. We lost a gigantic amount of advertising and a rival newspaper even sent a brass band to send a, to play a sort of mournful tune outside the office, like a sort of funeral march, as if to say the Manchester Guardian, as then was, is on its way out. Um, but it's seen as that that positioning, it, it, it was the decisive positioning that said the Guardian will now be a paper of the left um, and made it sort of was it was the beginning, really, of making it who we are today. So. Um, Looking at the histories, going back to the roots, working out who you are. I think, I think if if it's and I know it's easy to say and harder to do, but to really have faith in what you're good at, and not be kind of pulled this way and that by whichever pivot is in fashion at the time. You know, um, the what people can't mimic reporting, good old fashioned reporting, or modern reporting with new techniques, but doing the reporting finding out what's happening, finding out some, some, something that someone doesn't already know, that someone wants hidden, just, you know, getting back to the basics of who you are and your real identity. Um, and then I think, I mean, similar, similar on that point about Pivot, actually, is, is really being meaningful in everything you do. Um, you know, if you're going, if you're a digital, you know, so in our case, you know, you know, one of the ways when I took over that you could show how digital you were was that people were saying, oh, you know, you could be rude about print. And I think, well, if we're going to be rude about print, then let's not have a newspaper. Much better to say, no, we're going to produce a really good newspaper. Uh, we're a digital news organization, but you're going to produce a really good newspaper as well. And or, or don't produce it at all. I think, you know, high quality uh, matters. Um, and then I think, you know, thinking about who your audience is and what kind of relationship you want with them is really important and increasingly so. You know, can they be part of your future? Can they be part of the solution? Can the readers help you work out what comes next? So, so let's dive into two of the things you mentioned there. The first one I think is really important, which is focus, the newsroom having to focus. My, my old boss, Marty Barron, who I think is at the conference at this conference in a couple of days, he was fond of saying that there's this notion that publishers need to be comprehen comprehensive no longer works because there's this thing called the Internet and that's comprehensive enough. You know, he argued that publishers have to pick their spots and dominate those. So what are the key coverage areas as you look for this identity of The Guardian that you decided to focus on and why did you pick them? And what did also importantly, what did you decide not to do anymore? Yeah, I'd be a little bit cautious about that, though. I mean, I think Marty's Washington Post was pretty comprehensive. Um, so I think, you know, I think I do think if you're a big news organization, you do have to cover quite a lot of territory. You can't sort of say we're going to leave that, you know, we're going to not do sport. Or something. In, in my view, I do think you need a kind of base level of something that's quite comprehensive. But then, yes, of course, um, focusing is a really uh, smart idea. I mean, the one of the um, uh, in the environment is a big area for The Guardian. That's an important area for us that, um, you know, has given us a huge number of sco scoops, a really um, excellent audience. You, uh, you know, used to be, I remember the days when stories about the environment didn't get an audience, but we really, really get an audience to it now, I think, which is partly, I think, um, how we promote those stories but it's and how we report them. But I think also there is a real energy and 
as as, a, as we need there to be around those um, those stories. So I think that's um, an incredibly important um, area for us. Um, I think you know um, allied to that science and health reporting, which we've been committed to and has really um, obviously really mattered uh, this year. Um, uh, I think investigations again. Um, you know, I'm not sure if you're a public interest uh, news organisation, you really do need to have an investigative strand. And that doesn't need to be something that's hived off. It could be a, a small team um, at the core where this is what we do, where people come in and out according to the story. And I think that gives it a real dynamism and a sort of sense of um, drive. Um, and then, you know, more broadly, sort of public uh, interest journalism, you know, who has power and why have they got it? Who is corrupt and what they're doing about it? Who's trying to hide things? Um, and of course, lots of it flows back to politics. And so that's one of the things I think, you know, when I set up Guardian Australia, I launched Guardian Australia in 2013. It's a digital only uh, website. It was a lot of fun. Uh, this is before I was editor in chief. And um, we decided to focus on, I mean, we were tiny. I think we were about 25 people, if not fewer, when we started. So we were really, really small. And we decided to focus on on the environment because we felt that's a huge story in Australia. You see it, you, you live it, um, the climate crisis, you live it every day. But um, but it was really not being covered that well. And it's quite a um, toxic subject in Australia. So we, on the environment, we wanted to do um, uh, border policy um, and uh, refugees. And again, I feel that we really help put that subject back on the map in Australia. But then the third item was federal politics. Now, there were a lot of people already covering federal politics, but we felt we could cover it in a different way that was less about the horse race, more about the policy, that we felt that we could do it in a really serious um, way. But it wasn't just that it was distinctive. It's just, I think, unless you have politics, I think it is quite hard to say that you are a you know, you, you're a website of that country. So, and, that, and that really was effective. Those those three prongs really were effective, you know, um, trying to be distinctive, but not always in ways of, of numbers, if you see what I mean. Yeah, no, it's very interesting. I, let's switch topics a little bit. So mm -hmm. six years ago, you wrote a piece uh, that turned out to be uh, quite prescient about uh, how social media had helped usher in an era when everyone has their own facts. I'm, I'm going to quote a section of the piece, uh, we're caught in a series of confusing battles between opposing forces, between truth and falsehood, fact and rumor, kindness and cruelty, between the few and the many, the connected and the alienated, between the open platform of the web as its architects envisioned it, and the gated enclosures of Facebook and other social networks, between an informed public and a misguided mob. Since you wrote that piece, it seems to me that things have actually gotten worse and not better. Um, how do we as journalists function in a world where the truth is under constant assault by people who seem to have no moral issue with bending the truth for their advantage? Well, I think obviously that what got worse since I wrote that article was uh, Donald Trump got elected. So that was, um, I think that gave so much validity to the idea of of uh, you know you know uh, you don't need to speak the truth. Um, and I think you know I really really struggled with this during Trump's uh, presidency um, because I re I clearly remember um, quite soon after he was elected he gave some speech I can't remember what it was and um, I woke up and I saw that the uh, the US team had fact checked the speech and I thought oh, that was a good idea. And then I saw that the BBC had fact-checked it and I saw the New York Times had fact-checked it and the Washington. And I thought, wow, so almost every news organization in the world was focused on fact-checking this speech. And that doesn't, that doesn't seem like the best use of all of those journalists' time. Now you probably want somebody to fact-check it. I, I always used to say at the beginning, I couldn't really get people interested in this. I wanted one group to fact-check it for everybody. And then all the rest of us to start thinking about, well, you know, what is he actually doing? Because focusing on what he's saying all the time obscures what he was doing. And obviously a lot of what he did was incredibly dangerous. And I think some of our best reporting out of Guardian US was looking at what he was actually doing. Um, but also looking at why do people, you know, what effect is this ha happening, having on, pe on political discourse? What effect is this ha having on how people um, experience politi politicians and politics? You know, why do so many people still support him? 
um, and trying to sort of square all of that. While accepting that, you know, without social media, Trump would not have been able to drive the lies in the way that he did. It's just true. And I think, you know, I think Trump and perhaps the, all the misinformation that has been uh, transmitted about um, healthcare. Obviously, there's some overlap in that story, but around around COVID, um, I think you know maybe now people are realizing that there does seem to there does have to be some kind of accountability for these social media platforms spreading misinformation because it, it can't really carry on. People's lives are at risk. I mean, you were writing about Brexit, right, at that point, and you were writing about all the all the misinformation um, and how effective it had been for the people who were who were peddling the misinformation. And so now it seems that we have this accepted strategy that politicians use now. What what's the message to to your reporters as as you know we deal with with people who we quote who are telling us things that we know aren't true. Yeah, I mean I've never had any difficulty in sort of saying that people are allowed to call that out. I mean I think um uh, you know, just sort of saying, you know, this isn't true and here's why. I mean, I think that's, I think that's uh, always been fine at The Guardian. Um, I mean, we, I mean, but I, but I, I, I recognise what you're saying. I mean, our Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, at the moment, he's in, um, you know, there's been several sources for something he says he didn't say, uh, saying, you know, if I, about something like, let the bodies pile up in the streets, I don't want another lockdown. And, um, you know, People are saying, well, you know, it won't affect how people see Boris Johnson because it's just it's just factored in that he lies. And, you know, you can go, yeah, fine. Or you can go, what a situation are we in? That that could be the way we talk about the prime minister, you know. Um, and um, I, I, I'm very concerned about where this leads. Um, so I, th as in, you know, if, if people don't believe any politicians, then I think we're in for quite, you know, as I sort of wrote in that piece, uh, those years ago, I, th I think that that is the setting that's ripe for, you know, quite um, dangerous kind of politics. Yeah, switching back to the to the social media uh, companies, you know, the big topic of the moment is compensation from social media companies to publishers. Uh, there are a few people who've started to to write that, you know, wait a minute, this violates one of our big ethics, right? Which is we don't take money from anyone, much less companies we cover. So put you on the spot here at a, at a conference that Google is partially sponsoring. Should we be taking this money from social media companies uh, for their use of our content? I mean, I think I think there's no doubt that um, search and social media companies, you know, benefit massively from the use of um, journalists, our journalism on their platforms, right? So I think particularly, uh, so you mentioned Google. I think you know Google search would be. Um, without trusted sources of information would be um, quite empty. Um, and so I think I think it's reasonable. And, I, you know, we've been pushing for quite some time to, to suggest that platforms pay to license journalism. Um, um, and it's interesting, I think, that the countries that have forced this uh, to the table the most are those such as Australia, where there's been real political pressure. That's where it needs to start, um, uh, sort of uh, pressure. Yeah political pressure. Um, but obviously, you know, I mean, the amount, I think the amounts that people are talking about are really the same as a big advertiser. And we we cover big advertisers very well, just as we cover the platforms very well. I think, you know, the problem comes if people are told to hold back on their reporting because of the amount of money they get from either a platform or an advertiser. Um, and um, that's when the problem comes. I don't think you'll see that at The Guardian, uh, but I can see that it puts smaller news organizations under a lot of pressure. All right, let's talk a little bit about the pandemic, uh, how that has affected everything from your business model to the people in your newsroom. Uh, I recently judged a couple of journalism contests and I can attest to the fact that your product remains very strong. Have we won what something? Have we won something? Uh, what are some of the challenges uh, you have overcome to keep the report so strong? Mm, thank you. I appreciate that because it's obviously been a very uh, challenging uh, year for everybody. Um, I mean, at the same time, I sort of think it's kind of um, incredibly impressive how resilient and resourceful the journalists have shown themselves to be. 
Um, uh, so I, I'm um, at the beginning, we had, well, we, we all along, we've had to have a small team in the office uh, because we can't produce the newspaper. Otherwise, we can obviously do the website from from anywhere, but we can't produce the paper unless we have some people in the office. And, you know, at the beginning, that was very, very scary for people. And uh, I really appreciate them doing that. Um, and then I think I think what happened is that, you know, it, it's fluctuated as we've had um, lockdowns in the UK and um, and real dramatic waves of deaths. Um, you know, the challenge has been, um, you know, to try and keep people's, uh, you know, keep, keep people's confidence really going that they can that they can do it that they can, uh, you know, keep themselves together because, you know. Uh, touch uh, well it, it's very very challenging it's very disturbing we we actually lost a colleague uh, a few days ago in India um she died age 51 and uh it's just been very shocking for us all that um that it could come so close to us so um uh yeah it's just sorry I'm meandering it's um uh it was it was just quite a shocking incident that happened recently Amelia so Oh, I'm very sorry for your yeah. loss. So, so this stress that that people are under. Different media companies are doing different things. Extra days off, uh, you know, a day here and a day there. But of course, an extra day off when you can't leave your house is just another day uh, in the you know in the cage, if you would. It feels like sometimes. Uh, are there any things you all have done that's unique, or any any ways that you've come up with people mm -hmm. to help relieve some of this stress? Yes, I think there's some things that have really um, worked well and actually we might keep even if or uh, when we're all back in the office so um you might know but one of the things we have at the garden we have an op open morning conference uh, which used to be every day would be uh, in a room in the office anybody could come you didn't have to be a journalist you could be any guardian employee and uh we would talk about the previous day we would talk about the day upcoming and we might take a couple of big themes so is very sort of open and visible and we transferred that to being online monday wednesday friday and as a result so we the room in the um in the office could fit probably 60 or 70 people in you know we've had one day we had 550 people dialing in uh right and you know when i hear you know the foreign correspondents absolutely love it they feel really connected to head office in a way they weren't able to you know the australian team if they can be awake. I mean, it takes a lot to get the uh, New Yorkers awake, but sometimes we get them to come in, um, you know, because it's at uh, 10 a.m. London time. Um, so it's a, that has been a really positive way to bring people together and people really like it. Um, we also did this thing that I love called random lunches, where on a Friday you go, you sent your name in. Um, my PA picked a number of names out of a hat and you were put together to have a Zoom lunch together. And people loved it. They met people that, colleagues they never met before you know it's this thing that we just all miss each other I think we just miss seeing each other um we've shown that we can do the work I mean by the way I don't think the work is, is as good as if you can be in the office throwing ideas around particularly when the news agenda is quieter as it's becoming as it is uh, in fits and starts at the moment I think you much need to be you need definitely need to have groups uh throwing ideas around but I think you know we can do the work but the kind of the bonds the kind of teamwork the creativity um I think we're really missing that so yeah the random lunches were were really positive as well I'd recommend those I can tell you what not to recommend uh I hold a uh, open office door uh every Friday where I just announce on slack that I'm available uh no one comes uh, no one <laughs> in my Slack. Uh, it's very lonely when you're in a pandemic and in a Slack room where no one comes. So it's but like, it must be partly because you you must have met very few of your colleagues in person. I mean, you started in. Kathy, you would think that would be a strength. You think they'd want to come meet the new person, but no. Clearly, word about me has gotten out, and they're like, "I'm not going there." No. <laughs> the only one who come with the interns. The interns are there, but that otherwise, no one comes. Uh, but but you you're touching on something here that I think uh, is going to be a, an issue for all of us. So we've done surveys of our newsroom. Other uh, uh, publishers have done the same. And it's pretty overwhelming when you ask people about whether they want to come back after the pandemic to the office every day. Uh, they say no. Uh, most of them are willing to come back once or twice a week. Some don't want to come back at all. They don't want to deal with the commute and the cost and the time that they've lost. 
you know, their argument is that they've that they've proven that uh, we can function fine uh, remote. Why would we be together? So editors are going to have this tough decision to make about whether you make people come back to the newsroom. Have you thought about your uh, reopening strategy and, and how you're going to handle that? Yeah, we've been thinking about it a lot. I think it's really interesting because at the in that first phase, the bit I told you about when we had a when we you know we needed a few people in the uh, office to produce the paper and it was a very scary time absolutely nobody wanted to come into the office you know it was it was very few, it, we, were, we did well to get that team together um, and then as time went on we found that people really wanted to come back to the office because they were um, just finding it a bit boring um, and I think what I think people just have a really different views I think there are a whole range of views on this um, depending on people's home circumstances you know if you if you if you're in a shared uh, apartment where you have to, you know, you're working means having a laptop on your bed. I just don't think that's a good environment to work in. Obviously, if you're, um, well, you know, if you, I was going to say you're a rich journalist, but there aren't many of those. If you've got a rich partner um, and it means you've got a whole load of outside space and a beautiful office and so on, then I think it's easier. So I think, the, I think we need to, you know, I th also think different desks are are different. You know, I think, um, you know, it may, maybe that certain teams work better remotely because they need to, you know, if you, I, th I think there's no doubt if you want to dig into a document or spend a lot of time with one, say, doing a huge edit, it's you're better at home. There are fewer inter interruptions as long as you've got quiet at home and, and not, um, you know, children and pets running in and so on. Um, Whereas if it's kind of ideas, brainstorms and stuff, it's better in the office. So I think I think the thing we'll be doing is working with colleagues to work out the best way. I imagine it will be some kind of hybrid model that we end up with. Um, but there's some very interesting research going on about this. And I think it's a very live thing. I think it's changing all the time. So I want to be sure that we um, don't make changes that we then sort of regret that we, you know, that we make good changes that will last. Yeah, and, and I don't think it's it's, it's something that's going to be unique to journalists. It's going to be every office everywhere, you know, and out here there's been a, a real split. There are, you know, Twitter told people they never have to come back. You know, they can, uh, they can live wherever they want. Google told people nah, going to be within a hundred miles of the office. Um, some places let go of their uh, office real estate. Uh, other companies like Google have been snapping it up. Uh, so I don't think anybody knows what what is exactly going to happen. It's really interesting. Absolutely, and um, that's why I think you know personally, I think not making too big decisions that you can't you can't uh, reel back because I think things might change again. Who knows how they're going to change? I mean, if there's one thing the last five years have taught us is that you just don't know what's coming. And so, um, yeah, I think we need to be uh, careful in how we make such decisions. Well, there's one question that above all that I wanted to make sure I, I posed to you because it is the single most important issue that we deal with. Uh, and, and I would start by saying I'd be remiss if I didn't take this opportunity to thank you and all the British people for saving the world uh, from one of the greatest threats to humanity in the history of mankind, uh, the Super League. Uh, <laughs> my people, uh, the Spanish folded like a cheap face mask and actually are still part of the rebel camp by themselves on an island somewhere. The British came through for the world uh, in a way that we will always, always remember. <laughs> Where do you stand on the Super League? Where were you when this thing happened? Did, were you on the street protesting? <laughs> how, how did you handle it? I have to say it was such a weird um, subject in the UK because, you know, it, it, it united the nation. We were, we were, you know, I was trying to say, one of my jokes to the team was, you know, can you find me someone who's in favor of this bloody thing? You know, because um, you know, so I think uh, it's so rare to find something that everyone is opposed to. But yes, I'm a Leeds United fan. Um, and, uh, you know, we managed to play in Europe several times over the past few decades um, and, and done very well. And we're completely left out of any Super League negotiations. Um, it's, I do think there's something kind of interesting. I mean, just to be serious for a moment, I do think it the Super League is a very anti-Guardian idea. You know, um, you know, we're about fair play. We're about underdogs having a chance. We're about fairness. You know, you get promoted fairly or demoted fairly. This is the opposite of that. And I think the fact that the world united against these plans, or most of the world, shows that most of the world really are natural Guardian readers and uh, our traffic should be much higher. 
All oh, our traffic. Are Barcelona yeah. still in it then? What was that? Are Barcelona still saying they're in it? Yeah, Real Madrid is still on that hill saying, oh, yeah, we're just going to tweak. We're just going to tweak. We'll be back. We're just going to tweak. You know, wow. It is the most American of things, I, I have to say, uh, to have uh, rich people own leagues and then never have to worry about being relegated and just take the TV money every year. It's quite a... Uh, it's quite an uh, appealing thing, but uh, yeah, that was absolutely wild. One of the one of the craziest sports stories, and over in a nanosecond, uh, <laughs> how quickly they folded. Uh, ab absolutely. Yeah, I mean, we and we. I hope you read the Guardian coverage of that because we had some absolutely brilliant coverage, brilliant columns. It was it was great. Yeah, that was story seven thousand one hundred and twelve, <laughs> seven thousand one hundred and thirteen, and seven thousand one hundred and fourteen that I have not yet contributed to. Uh, I'm very a good example of what you know. I think you know the intersection of sport with politics, just like the intersection of anything with politics, ends up being very revealing about a country and its priorities and what's going on. And you know, everything is interesting, isn't it? Yeah, well, and it's also I think goes back to to audience, right? If you can find topics that people are passionate about, uh, and and people will. Uh, People will actually live and die for. It. That's how you start to see revenue increase. And and mm -hmm. and and frankly, I tell people this, and they get very angry. But that is the lesson of Donald Trump for all of us, right? The lesson for Trump is if you find uh, a topic that is unifying, uh, either on one side or the other, the eyeballs will come, the revenue will come, uh, and and it becomes a a, a dominant sort of a storyline. Uh, which takes me to my next question, which is a lot of publishers in the United States are, are seeing a very big drop in audience uh, in the past few months. Uh, you know, some people are saying, you know, it's just the, the news heavy period. It's the end of the news heavy period and, and it's natural. Others are saying, no, 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 it's all it's all about Trump. You know, what are you seeing in your numbers, uh, both in the U.S. and uh, and in England? And do you think it's natural? Do you think it's going to will bounce out of it or what? It's interesting, isn't it? Because Trump, I'm, I mean, so many theses have been and will be written about this, but Trump put journalists' lives in danger while, you know, making their business models uh, soar. I mean, it's a really strange um, paradox. Um, yeah, I mean, our numbers are down on last year, but there's, you know, I'll give you an example. March that we've just been through, if you took 2020 out of it, would have been our biggest month ever. Oh, that's it's, great. Yeah, but it's just that 2020 was so exceptional. So for us, it was more the coronavirus crisis. I mean, in March 2020, we had 350 million uniques, 2 billion page views. I mean, it's absolutely off the map. Um, and so um, for Trump is input, you know, it was important to our traffic numbers, but I would say a, a sort of global coronavirus pandemic plus Trump was more um, the story for us. But yeah, the, the, our figures are still strong, but it's just obviously year on year, they, they're not as strong. And then how are you looking at this period? There are some news organizations that are hiring uh, into the pandemic and actually growing. And then, of course, there are the struggling organizations that are that are cutting. What strategically, what do you see you all doing? And I think um, I think you mean, you mean around science and health reporting. I mean, in terms of Just growing your newsroom or shrinking your newsroom, or how are you preparing for the period yeah. ahead? I mean, I think um, you know we our plan is to um, is to grow a bit next year. So you know, we're not. I don't sort of believe in uh, dramatic. Um, yeah, I don't believe this is a moment for a dramatic shift. So we're we're increasing our American newsroom and our Australian newsroom, we're in, and we're increasing in a couple of strategic areas in London, such as sort of audio and newsletters. Yeah, yeah it's really interesting. Some are, are, are growing great, great with great guns, which is um, fascinating and good for the industry. Uh, speaking of growing, I'm going to dip into the questions real quick. Uh, Lourdes Cueva Chacon from San Diego State University, which is uh, where my wife went, go Aztecs. Before the pandemic, there was news about The Guardian operating in Mexico in Spanish. Those of us who've tried foreign language and foreign language publishing know the danger there. Uh, what is the latest on that project? Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. We're not, we know we're not going to be doing it in Spanish, I'm afraid. Um, we do have a partnership in Spain uh, with um, a very good uh, online website called ildiario.es. But um, no, we don't have a, a Mexican project uh, live at the moment. I mean, there are, I agree with you, there are lots of risks in, um, 
in 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 translation uh so we're very cautious around that yeah for for those in the audience who've never tried it uh, number one it's expensive to translate everything number two you're essentially starting from scratch because google and the social and social media companies don't know who you are in a foreign language so it's very hard to build audience uh and then there's the whole you know building of a brand and and trying to find uh trying to get uh, audience for your news that way many have tried uh some have succeeded but many have have failed and i think most are trying small bore experiments as as they try to find a way in uh largely because for some publishers they feel they sort of maxed out in their language they feel they have all the english speakers they're likely to get and they feel like they uh Really, in the whole world. <laughs> well, I, I think you know if you look at those CNN numbers where yeah. they, you know, where they come in at a uh, 150 million a month sometimes, and there's, you know, 400 million Americans over the age of 18, uh, or 400 million Americans overall, and they're getting 150 over the age of 18. You do the math, they got to be thinking there's not a lot left, and so it's tempting to go there, but. Uh, as I said, many have uh, many have tried and, and many have failed. Um, yeah. I'll go to a, to something you touched on earlier, but I think is really important to a lot of the the people uh, on this call. Um, you know, many of them are wrestling still with the with the or beginning to wrestle with the the notion of how do you keep print vibrant? Still brings in the majority of revenues, but everybody knows they have to improve their digital report. Mm -hmm. We actually went to the Guardian um, when we met to actually learn from you all and and what you were doing because you were considered a, a ahead of the curve when it came to this. Um, so what have you learned about uh, how do you manage that transition and keep them both vibrant? Uh, and I know you don't like to give advice to, to other people about what they should do, but <laughs> damn it, Catherine, give advice to people about what they should do. Um, so um, I, do, I do think it, it's working pretty well, I have to say. So um, what we do, we have a small print team who are really excellent. Um, 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 but the 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 digital team is sits with the desks, with the national desk and international desk, and so on. Now, when I say sits with, obviously, uh, nobody really sits with anybody else at the moment. But that's the that's the the idea. So um, you know, we it's it's not really a conversation about digital first anymore. It's not really it's not really like that. Um, you know, you know, the what we just want the desk to do is to you know, deliver fantastic digital journalism all day and then make sure that they can make a good paper out of that at the end of the day. Um, I mean, I always say, you know, I mean, it is very, very, it, it, having run digital only newsrooms in Australia and America, the simplicity of just having digital, you know, the, the oh, just having one platform, actually. I remember the days of just having print as well, just having one platform. It's just, there is a simplicity about it. Your days are much more relaxed. Um, but I think you know we are the generation that's that's got to do both, and so we have to find ways to do to do both. Um, I'm not one of those people who sort of wants to talk down print and so on. I think it's just it's another platform for Guardian journalism. Yeah, you know, we've got a fantastic weekly magazine. That's another platform. You know. Yeah, the the, the best I heard of this uh, about print was actually the uh, the owner of the of the Post, Jeff Bezos, who was asked. It gets asked a lot, you know, when is print going to die? And his answer was always, well, you know, years and years ago, everybody rode horses and horses were the were the key form of transportation. Um, and then eventually it was replaced by something else. But people still ride horses. And, and so he views it as eventually as never going away and mm -hmm. becoming a niche product at a very high, uh, uh, very high subscription rate. Uh, or cost that will be for this for whatever number of people still wants to read print, and it's an interesting way of looking at it because I was one who uh, famously in 2003 predicted that all of print would be dead by 2011. Oh. Uh, so you really don't want to take any gambling advice from me, uh, <laughs> or really any advice at all from me, uh, because I got that completely wrong. So thinking of it as something that is never going away makes it actually a little easier uh, as you try to um, as you try to uh, uh, plan things out. Um, but let's I mean, look ahead. The stuff, the stuff that might get in that way in the UK is, is sort of distribution models. That's the stuff that might be the biggest challenge in the UK rather than readers desire for it, I think. 
Yeah, and, and in the US, which is a very home delivered product where publishers now work together to deliver each other's products. What, what we're seeing is a publisher will drop Saturday as print and then everybody else has to drop Saturday because wow. there's no way to deliver it. Uh, and so uh, we've created a little bit of a dependent uh, delivery system that could come back and, and, and force a strategic decision. So it's, uh, it's, it's quite complicated. Um, so before we go to reader questions, I'm going to ask you to, to look ahead a little bit. Um, you know, the pandemic, good God, it has to end soon, hopefully, or we're all going to lose our minds. You know, breakfast, Brexit did not destroy Europe. Things have calmed down there a bit. I, I, can, you, can you tell the journalists here that maybe we're in for a period of calm back to the days when there's, you know, you don't have to wake up in the morning and look at your phone and, oh, my God, the world is on fire again? Uh, or, or will these daily eruptions, you know, these hurricanes uh, just continue, but in other areas? What, what do you think is going to happen? I don't see calm coming at all, I'm afraid, Emilio. I mean, I think you use the word hurricanes. It's literal hurricanes. It's, I think the, the climate crisis is, is the backdrop to all of these things you talk about. And um, unless that is tackled in a very, very serious way, um, that I don't see any calm. And I think, you know, we know what that drives it doesn't just drive destruction of the natural world which is bad enough it also um drives sort of terrible consequences in a social and political way as well so um um you know i think you could argue in fact that the technological revolution and and the climate crisis are what underpins all of these uh big shifts we've seen in recent years but maybe that might be a bit of a stretch but no we have out here we have fires because of uh, global warming and you're living in it. Yeah. And the fire season, you know, we saw what happened in Australia. It's terrible out here. Yeah, no, I, unfortunately, I think you're right. Um, uh, I used to, I used to tell people, remember when Obama was president in his second term and no one was reading anything and everyone was bored. Uh, that's never coming again. Uh, and so we should have been, uh, uh, we should have been uh, uh, content uh, during that period as opposed to being cranky. Uh, but yes, uh, it, it does seem that that the world will continue to be a, uh, a series of hurricanes. All right, we're going to jump into uh, uh, the reader questions. Uh, and so here's one from Caroline Garnieri. Uh, what do you think is the role of freelance journalism in big companies in the future? Is this model gaining space or losing? And how does this work in The Guardian? Yeah, I mean, I think I think it's it's a tough world, isn't it, to be um, a freelance journalism, uh, a freelance journalist at the moment. I think uh, lots of people have been hunkering down, um, um, and uh, but we do use a lot of freelance journalists at the Guardian, and we have some really great people. Some of them are on sort of contracts, and some of them just complete freelancers. Um, and you know what I'd always say is, you know, think about the thing that only you know about, that only you can discover or. Um, un uncover um, and you know build relationships with editors um, um, you know so that they trust your work when you approach them um, but I think I know I think it's tough but um, you can definitely make an impact lots of big stories have come from freelancers another question from Rudolph Kyle Peralta in, in the Philippines I heard that you mentioned I heard you mentioned advertising a while ago how do you handle the separation of advertising partners, uh, the company's advertising partners and the news writers in terms of influence in news writing? Yeah, I mean, they just, it, they just have nothing to do with each other. You know, we'd, we wouldn't allow them to have anything to do with a, a few, each other. A few years ago, we had a big exclusive from a very, very big advertiser, on a very, very big advertiser. And what happened then is that the advertiser pulls their advertising. It's not that the, the we pull our story. Um, so, and it's very, very important that that principle is maintained if you want to be um, in the public interest. I think so. You know, the reporters, um, you know, they might tell us if they think that, you know, they might say, or oh, you might want to know about this. Um, but then we wouldn't, uh, you know, we would never, um, we would never pull a story on that basis. It's very important that that's a rule. Yeah, I think that it's an issue around the world that is very different by country and, and, and traditions. But I think that's one where England and the United States are, are quite fully aligned. Uh, question from Ivan Mendez. 
For The Guardian, what, did, what was the biggest difficulty in reporting on COVID-19 and its effects? The fake news, the matrices created by the government to bring security, the immediacy of releasing the information on social networks. How do you move among those pressures? Yeah, it's all of those things, isn't it? I think, I think um, the misinformation and how quickly some of those stories took hold, I think, was pretty uh, challenging. Um, I think, for me, it was how to commute, try and un get people to understand the scale of the deaths. So um, I felt, I remember at the end of March thinking all of these people were dying and yet they were just numbers. And so we've start, we started several projects, Lost to the Virus, where we've profiled, done 4,000 word profiles of uh, some of the victims um, uh, lost on the front line in the US where we uh, track every single health worker who's died of COVID-19. And that's a really brilliant resource as well. Um, to try and humanize it, I think it's a very, it's a strangely invisible pandemic. Um, all the photographs, even people say, oh, that's a brilliant set of photographs from that hospital, but everyone's got masks on and PPE and you you can't really connect with them. Um, so it's it's really hidden and hidden because we're all locked away as well. So I think to try and I think the challenge I've had is to is to communicate the humanity of it. Um, and I think, you know, with the misinformation, it's to try and ensure that we have our we've got brilliant scientific experts, science experts, and to make sure that they, they bring that rigor to the reporting. So everyone might be getting excited about some new cure or preventative or whatever, and we'll make sure that it has that scientific lens on it. And we won't cover it even if lots of other people are. Um, but yeah, I'd say they were, the big, they were the big issues. Yeah, I agree on photography. I think one of the great um, struggles of the early part of the pandemic was that most photographers in the US were shut out of hospitals. And so no one saw the suffering. Yeah. And those who doubted the importance of photography that shows the human condition, it was a great example of how we need to maintain the vibrancy uh, and, and aggressiveness in our photography because people weren't seeing it. And I think it was easy to say, it doesn't really exist. That's not the me. Are you but the trouble is even when you get in there though, Emilio, you can't. Yeah, no. It's hard to visualize. I think, I mean, the, the other aspect actually, I think was, you know, particularly at the beginning, we were doing a lot of really hard reporting, you know, a lot of reporting on who gets the contracts from the government. There's been what we call, called, uh, what's called in Britain, chumocracy, but might be called in some countries corruption. But, you know, when, uh, when um, contracts are awarded to friends of ministers and so on, um, we were doing a lot of hard reporting at the beginning and to start with that we were the only ones doing that and that felt quite lonely you know it felt like uh, everyone else was trying to sort of say don't worry we'll all have some summer holidays and so on I think I think the other papers hardened up as the pandemic went on but at the beginning it did just feel like that holding power to account bit had been sort of dropped elsewhere. And the, the other big frustration, of course, is we have no idea how many people actually died from it or how many people actually had it, right? We know the count is low. We know people weren't diagnosed. We know public officials all over the world are hiding numbers. It will be years before we actually know how many people truly were affected by this. So it's a little frustrating. Uh, all right, let's do a, a staple of all conferences. I, I will not, uh, I will pronounce the first name, Pratiba. Uh, from Hello from India, what is your advice to an early career journalist trying to break into the industry? Hi, Pratiba. Um, well, first of all, good luck. Um, it's it's really tough, but um, you know there's plenty of opportunities. And it's um it's the main bit of advice I have is um is is I'm, something I've already mentioned actually, which is to find the bit that you know about. So, um, you know, it may be your hometown that news organization doesn't have a reporter in but something's going on there it may be a specialist subject that from your um academic life or from your um hobbies it may be only something that you know about so it may just be a personal story and so when you pitch that they say well only this person knows about this um and then they get to know about you i mean the other thing is i i, I know it sounds really banal but really um if you can manage to get sort of work experience or or internships, whatever, really, really work hard and take on the lowest jobs. Don't be um, afraid to make 
the tea. People really like it if you make them a cup of tea. I admit I'm speaking for Britain there and, and probably India. Uh, but people like it if you make them a cup of tea in the afternoon, right? So, um, you know, and then they start to say, well, who's this person making a cup of tea? Maybe we can give them a bit of research to do and you never know where it might lead. So don't be afraid of doing the lowly stuff and, and uh, become an expert in something that only you know about. All right, another question along that theme from Andresa. Uh, does the Guardian accept interns who have work experience but didn't have the opportunity to pursue an undergraduate degree yet? Um, the, the rules are um, quite tough on uh, internships at the Guardian, and obviously we're not doing them so much at the moment during the pandemic, but really it's an age, it's just you have to be 18. Um, um, that's the main um, uh, rule, but um, so it's worth applying. Uh, but it's it's we don't have um, the elaborate schemes that you have in the U.S. and and, and maybe we should. Uh, okay, some business model questions. How much, in terms of profile and pay, do you value columnists and commentary, op-ed contributors? Um, I think you know it's really interesting. I've been mentioned earlier that I've been doing lots of research on the history of the Guardian, and um, you know, columnists are a pretty new invention. Uh, it was sort of in the 80s that that uh, that they started to uh, become um, dominant. Um, and, you know, I would still always, always say that the most important role of a news organisation is reporting. Um, and I think the best kind of columnists um, are those who don't just say, this is bad. Uh, they say, this is bad and here is how you could do it better. You know, here are some ideas I've been reading about or I've heard about or how things could be improved, how... You know, so it's, so that those who bring ideas, not just critiques, those who can, um, you know, give give creative thought, um, not just um, an attack. Um, I'm 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 slightly over that kind of the sort of ranting kind of column. I think um, the hot take or even the cold take, but you know, just the the take. I think it's um, I think you can get that just, just about everywhere. Um, and I'm much more interested in learning something new, getting new information. Uh, or a new idea. One of the phenomenons in, in now that I'm in the local news business is how difficult it is for a general interest local columnist to get digital audience because they're constantly jumping from topic to topic mm -hmm. and the search engines really don't recognize them. So building up a, a, a digital audience for uh, a local columnist and digital sometimes can be uh, really, really hard. A uh, couple questions about growth from Reina and Nuzarat. One is in one areas is the Guardian growing in the US and how is the Guardian looking to grow in international markets? Mm. Good questions. I mean, the US, um, it is it is really, um, it's going great in the US. Uh, I think, um, you know, we've got a small newsroom, well, several small newsrooms in, in New York, Washington and, and, and Oakland. Um, and I think they've really made an impact by focusing on uh, climate, on, um, public lands, on access to clean air and uh, water, um, and, and on social justice movements. So I think I think they've really uh, been making an impact. Um, and we are expanding, as I mentioned, uh, in a small way uh, this year in, in the US. Um, and uh, I think it, it's, it's going really well. Um, uh, Australia is also uh, thriving and, um, uh, you know, is it's got a different kind of approach because it's it very much is a local news site in Australia. It really competes with um, um, and in fact beats a lot of uh, local news uh, sites there. Um, but internationally, you know, we have a more than seventy percent of the Guardian's audience is outside of the UK. Um, uh, you know, the New York Times and Washington Post figures are are much lower than that for outside of the US. Uh, so we already are, we already have a big international voice. And that is something I'm interested in looking at more. We have a very, very big audience in Europe. I think they really trusted us for our reporting on Brexit. Uh, there's obviously um, a lot of people who speak English as a second language in, in Europe. Um, um, so Europe would be the most obvious place for us. But, um, you know, we have big audiences everywhere. Um, Canada, New Zealand, obviously, but also um, India, um, as well. Second to last question, and it's a good one. Uh, what are your thoughts about two sidisms, which is the, the notion of giving uh, the opinions of two people on an issue, uh, even though the facts they're using on one side might not be factually true? Uh, what is your guidance for your reporters in that area? 
yeah, we, we never we never do that. We've never done that. Um, I think, again, I think that it, it's not really part of the British journalistic tradition to do that. Um, although, you know, the BBC did get into a bit of trouble over that, about that over um, the environment. So, uh, but certainly, you know, on the environment, we stopped uh, quoting denialists a long time ago. Um, and, you know, as I said, I think what you need to do, what we need to do is report what's, what's true um, uh, rather than have ones on the one side and on the other. All right, and final question from Emilio in San Francisco. Are you a Harry Megan person or a William <laughs> Kate person? Explain. God, you saved the most controversial question to last. Exactly, and, the hardest one at the end. And you know, it's, um, it's uh, you know, the Guardian is, a, is not a royalist newspaper. In fact, we are a Republican paper who has many times in our history campaigned for the end of the monarchy. Um, uh, so if you, on that basis, who's mo like, most likely to uh, bring the monarchy to an end, it would be Harry and Meghan, wouldn't it? Uh, but, you know, I've got to be careful what I say, Emilio. You know, I don't want to end up in the tower, have my head chopped off. <laughs> and with that, with head chopping, we will call it a day. Catherine, so much. Thank you so much uh, for your candid answers to the questions. <laughs> Uh, and with that, uh, I will end this. I don't know how to end it. I assume someone will end it for me. Thank, thank you, you all so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Oh, Rosenthal's back. Yes, thank you so much. This was brilliant. I am fascinated. <laughs> all right, thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Um, well, you, you know, like I, like I said, I'm, I, I was uh, delighted with this session. Thank you, Catherine, and thank you, Emilio. For, for this incre incredible insight. I, I, I told you all that this would be a fascinating session and it was a fascinating se session indeed. Uh, we, we all learned a lot. We are grateful to hear from both of you, Kath and, and Emilio. Okay, so join us back here in a quick 30 minute break for our first workshop, uh, our workshop of today how to develop secure communication with sources and a drop box for whistleblowers. This is a, a very, very important issue that newsrooms all over the world have been struggling with. So I think you should, uh, you, you should make sure your, your newsroom gets someone learning in the, in the session that is about to start in 30 minutes, 11.30 central time of the US. Thank you very much and see you soon.